All right, good afternoon. I thank you guys for joining us today for this installment of the All Bugs Good and Bad webinar series. Um, it's brought to you by Texas AgriLife Extension, uh, Alabama Cooperative Extension, the University of Georgia Extension, Clemson Cooperative Extension, and the E-Extension Communities of Practice, Ant Pest, and Urban IPM. Uh, my name is Allison Shable, and I'm from Alabama Extension, and uh, I will be helping moderate today along with Marcus Garner. Um, our topic today is aphids, white flies, and scales, and it's presented by uh, Irfan Vaffy. Uh, Irfan has been working for Texas AgriLife Extension since 2013 as an extension specialist, providing resources and programming on IPM for the green industry. He got his B Bachelor's of Science in Animal Physiology from Western Ontario University and a Master's in Pest Management at Simon Fraser. These are focused on biological controls of common pests such as aphids and whiteflies. Mr. Vaffy continues to uh, research and provide green industry growers with the resources and new tools for best management practices and how to identify good insects from bad and also promotes the use of biological controls where practical and economical. Um, for more information on his work, take the time to visit his website, sixleggedaggy.com, or his Facebook site, uh, page Six Legged Aggie, which he uses to distribute information about six legged anything six legged related to the green industry professionals and to home gardeners. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you, uh, Irfan. We thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, thank you for that great introduction, Allison. I really appreciate it. And thank you so much for everyone who's tuned in. Uh, so, you know, like I mentioned, we're going to be talking about aphids, scales, and white flies and also uh, a tad bit of mealybugs. I'll we'll throw those in there as well because they're closely related to scale insects. Uh, aphids, whitefly, scales, and mealybugs are all in this group called Hemiptera. They are true bugs, and as such, they share some similar features. Uh, yeah, yes. Sorry, so, sorry to interrupt you. We're seeing on your screen, we're seeing this, your build. Uh, you've got a build order that's down in the lower uh, right-hand corner that's showing up. I don't know, is that, is that something you can close or move all, off the screen? You said you're seeing a build order on the bottom right? Yeah, it's it's uh, a small window. It's got a start and a delay. Dr huh. Drop down button. Um, I I don't I don't see. Oh, uh, let me see here. Yeah, that yeah, yeah that that's one. probably what's showing up. Let's see. Is that better? Great. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. All right. So they all uh, share a similar feature, and that is uh, they all suck. And uh, by that I mean they have, they, they literally suck. They have sucking mouth parts. And so they use uh, their sucking mouth parts to penetrate the plant and uh, extract uh, basically the plant sap, the plant material uh, by which they can uh, essentially feed on the plant. And they're basically what a lot of them are trying to do is uh, filter out the nitrogen. That nitrogen they can use to make amino acids, which they can use to make proteins, which they can use to make more babies. So a lot of these insects are basically baby making machines. And uh, since they, they do kind of penetrate the plant and suck, as you can imagine, they are all kind of like uh, dirty needles. So they can also, this way, uh, vector plant viruses between different plants. Uh, so they are considered, uh, as just a pest itself, is considered a problem, but when they become vectors of viruses, they become a much bigger problem. So whether it be the tomato yellow uh, leaf curl virus or become citrus greening by uh, psyllids, uh, potato leaf roll virus, uh, so on and so forth, there are several different uh, viruses that they can potentially uh, vector. And when they're sucking on these plants, uh, they will actually, a lot of these, and there are some exceptions, but uh, will produce what's called honeydew. And this insect, you can see it very clearly here. Uh, these insects, uh, those drops you're seeing shoot off them are actually their honeydew. These are glassy winged sharpshooters. Uh, not one of the insects we're really gonna go into in detail today, but these little droplets are essentially sugary solution that when they hit a leaf surface, uh, they become a little bit shiny and become a good surface for uh, inoculation of sooty mold. So that's this black mold that starts to grow on top of the leaf. Uh, which can reduce the plant growth, uh, reduce its ability to absorb the rays of the sun uh, to get the strength that it needs. Uh, and so here are some examples. So if you see shining leaf surfaces and you know recently water hasn't just been sprinkled on it or it's not morning dew, uh, then it's possible that you have an infestation of one of these insects and it's worth uh, looking around to see if you can actually uh, see any of these sucking insect pests. So again, here are some uh, more examples of that, that shiny leaf surface 
And when it starts to get really bad, again, here is now uh, that black sooty mold. It essentially looks like soot. And you can see these little uh, white things on there as well. Uh, those are insect exuvia. So those uh, little white things are essentially when the insects uh, develop from one stage of development to the next, they shed off their skin, essentially. And so uh, if you see those, those are also signs that you have some kind of a heavy infestation of uh, these insects going on. Now, I thought I would touch on kind of white flies, aphids, and scale insects, just their general biology and life cycle, and then go on to how to actually uh, monitor and control them. So here's what an adult uh, white fly looks like. Adult white flies are winged. Uh, there are several different species, so there, there will be some uh, differences in how they look. And one of the, the white flies of, of great concern is actually this in, in the genus Bemisia. And the reason is because there are some, uh, back in 2004, they were first identified as being this, this Q-type white fly that has resistance to a lot of insecticides. So if you're finding yourself battling uh, white flies, no matter what insecticide you're throwing at them from the store, uh, then it might be the case that you have some white flies that are a little bit more resistant. And it might be uh, best if you don't keep using the same thing over and over again, uh, because you're probably killing all the good insects around, but not killing the uh, resistant uh, pests there. Here's a white fly. This is a white fly going in super slow motion. I love this video here. Uh, when you disturb them, uh, there's this characteristic uh, little thing they do is they jump off the leaf and they'll start flying away. And oftentimes they do almost like a figure eight and go right back on the leaf. And so uh, that's a fun little thing you can do and a nice way of kind of knowing if you, you potentially have uh, some adult white flies. And here are all the life stages in one beautiful photograph. So uh, they're eggs. They often lay them in clusters and oftentimes also in circles. So they'll, they'll, the adults will sometimes lay an egg and then slightly rotate and lay an egg, slightly rotate and lay another egg. And so they make this little uh, circle of eggs. And then out will uh, come with these crawlers. So that's the first stage that comes out. Uh, and essentially they're called crawlers because they will move around and look for a good spot to feed. Uh, so uh, once they finally establish somewhere, they'll start feeding and typically don't move around a whole lot. They go through these different developmental stages. So that's a second instar, then a third instar, a fourth instar, and eventually we'll pupate. So here is a pupa. Uh, now it is actually metamorphosing from this kind of crawler to uh, the adult. And these pupa and these nymphs, uh, they can actually vary in the way that they look. So here, this is the uh, Japanese bayberry white fly. Here's another one of the citrus white fly. You can see it, it looks quite a bit different. And uh, oftentimes these nymphs, you know, they'll kind of blend in with the leaf. They're quite transparent. So the nymphs themselves, unless you're really looking closely, uh, perhaps sometimes with the, the help of a hand lens, can be hard to see by themselves. But the pupa, the exuvia, that is after they've come out of the pupa, or the adults are typically a lot easier to see. We also have the woolly white fly as well as an example. So it gets that name woolly from the fact that it's uh, you know very hairy, like a like cheap wool. Uh, so you can get quite a bit of variation in the way that these white fly uh, pupa look. So that's that's just white fly, just recognition, identification, uh, and life cycle. Now going on to aphids. Yes, we know they suck. Uh, you can see right there, it's sucking mouth part, the proboscis. Uh, so if you see something that looks like this, but it has a chewing mouth part, uh, that means it's not an aphid. Uh, it's, you know, so, so that, you know, these aphids and hemipterans, uh, they all have sucking mouth parts. Now, the life cycle of aphids is uh, rather uh, crazy, really. Uh, there's a reason why they become such a big issue. So they reproduce uh, through what we call parthogenesis. So that is, they can reproduce asexually. Uh, so here, these females, in this case, a wingless female, produces live clones of herself. So she doesn't have to uh, find a, a mate. Uh, she just pumps out two to three live offspring every single day, and they are genetically identical to the mother. When there's, uh, you know, those conditions are right and the density of the, the aphids are kind of high, that mother will produce... Uh, offspring. They're still genetically identical to her, but there's certain genes and proteins that are all of a sudden turned on that causes her to form wings. So as she's developing, now she starts forming the structures to develop wings in order to migrate to a new habitat. So the density is really high, this habitat's degrading, it's time to find somewhere else to start producing some offspring. Uh, 
And then once it goes there, then that female will start uh, typically producing uh, non-winged aphids. Then from there, in the fall times, there's a number of cues, and depending on the species of aphid, there's over there's about 3,000 or, or more species of aphids. Uh, but there's certain uh, certain cues, environmental cues, like short day length, cooler temperatures, and degrading habitat, that will all of a sudden make these asexual wingless females produce sexual producing asexual females. Stay with me here. Don't go to Facebook. Come back. That means that that female will produce sexual males and sexual wingless females. So all of a sudden now they have males and females. These males and females will mate and produce eggs. Those eggs survive the winter, and then in the springtime, out comes what's called a foundress. So she's the first of her you know, colony, essentially, of producing clones of herself. Uh, and then the cycle continues. So there's a reason why they call aphids Darwinian demons, because essentially they can repro reproduce incredibly fast. But they also have a point in their life cycle, in the, in, in the general season, in which uh, you get males and females and you get genetic recombination so that you can get uh, some variation in the population again. So here is a female that's uh, currently in labor. Uh, and by currently, I mean this is a photograph, so not at this very instant. But in the photo photograph, you can see a live offspring coming out the, the rear there. Um, some some uh, kind of diagnostic features of aphids are these uh, cornicles, often known as cornicles. Uh, and they use these uh, oftentimes to communicate with other aphids. We'll see later on them exuding some what's called alarm pheromone. It's a, a drop that will come out and it actually volatilizes. It goes into the air and it warns the other aphids around that something really bad is happening. And we'll see an example of what constitutes something really bad for an aphid uh, later on for your pure enjoyment. Going on, uh, so these black spots here are not beauty moles on, on this uh, female aphid. Those are actually the eyes of offspring inside this aphid. So if you actually dissect a, a mother aphid and look inside, you can see several offspring being produced at any given time. So here there are, uh, let's see, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, at least nine embryos at different stages of development. Uh, almost like a Ford factory line. I would even argue uh, Ford probably got this his his factory line idea from aphids. No, probably not. But but <laughs> this entomologist would like to tell you so. Um, and so you know they they are just constantly pumping out babies at an incredibly fast rate. And like I mentioned earlier, you can get winged morphs and you can get non-winged morphs. You can even get different color morphs. So even though it is this this aphid is genetically identical to her mother she might come out a different color. She might all of a sudden come out red. Uh, and it's thought that this might be some kind of defense mechanism that perhaps under high predator pressure, they start producing uh, these red morphs in order to kind of warn off predators because it's seen as a, a danger kind of color. So that wraps up our, our little bit about aphids. Now going on to scale insects, uh, we're, we're gonna actually talk more specifically about these mealybugs, armor scale, soft scales, and bark or, or felt scales. Here are some example of some mealybugs. They often uh, are, are, they can be on, on the leaf, but oftentimes on the stem as well. And they uh, more often than not have this kind of waxy coating or waxy outer layer. And not all scale insects have them, but mealybugs uh, very commonly do. And uh, you can sometimes get scales or mealybugs, in this case, uh, on, on actually some of your pots. So this was an example of a grower that uh, had a bunch of mealybugs that got on their pots and were in egg sacs, so they're not actively feeding. They can't feed on plastic pots, um, but they will stay there. And if you, you plant something in there soon enough, then you've essentially just helped uh, those mealybugs reproduce and, and uh, continue on. Here's an incredibly entertaining video of a mealybug walking up a twig so that you don't have to do it on YouTube later today. That's... That was for your pure enjoyment. Now, this, this one right here, uh, I don't want you to be confused. So it looks like a mealybug, but it's actually um, a type of lady beetle larva. So these will actually kind of crawl around and eat away at uh, some of these other larvae. And um, how you can tell the difference between a mealybug and a lady beetle larva is that a mealybug will typically not have other mealybugs in its mouth uh, eating it whereas a lady beetle larva will. Uh, they will be eating other insects uh, as they are predaceous. 
Uh, here is an example of the cottony cushion scale, which was introduced in the US uh, in about 1868 in the citrus groves in California. It's a type of giant scale, uh, was wreaking havoc there on the citrus industry until they brought in uh, Vidalia beetle from uh, this scale insect's native habitat. This is what we call classical biological control. Uh, when you get a, a pest species from somewhere exotic, uh, you go back to its original territory and look for natural predators, uh, and you see, you know, you first have to determine what their, the ecological impact would be of releasing those predators in this new territory, and if it's uh, not big, then you release them. And this is one of the first examples that showed how effective uh, classical biological control could be, because the Vidalia beetle uh, successfully managed the cottony cushion scale very effectively. Uh, to the point that people stopped uh, using insecticides because it hurt the Vidalia beetle that was already effectively controlling uh, the cottony cushion scale for them. Here are some examples of some armored scales. So this one here is the false oleander, uh, or sorry, oleander scale. Um, and uh, this one is, uh, so hard scales, they feed differently than the other insects. And I mentioned earlier that there are some exceptions to the honeydew rule. And this is an example of one because hard scales do not produce honeydew. So as a result, you will not see shiny surfaces. You will not see production of sooty mold. Uh, and, and you won't see any of those signs. All you'll see is really these uh, scale insects on the actual leaf. Here is an example of some T-scales, uh, which you'll often find them, say, on camellias. And uh, those black ones are, are females uh, with eggs, and the white ones are uh, males that are metamorphosing. And they are also a type of a armored scale or hard scale, so they are not going to be producing any honeydew. But uh, when you turn over the back side of a leaf or something, you'll often see a lot of this kind of white powder or webbing. Um, I shouldn't say so much webbing, uh, a little bit more of a powdery, but you'll actually see these scale insects as well. Uh, and, and I retract the webbing statement only because the webbing can mean many other things as well. So that could be a bit confusing there. Uh, we also have uh, another one I want to talk a little bit more about is the crepe myrtle bark scale because uh, this is a relatively new invasive insect. And if you have any crepe myrtles in the landscapes in your area, uh, it might be worth checking to see if you have this scale on there. It was first found in northern Texas in 2004 and now has been found in uh, many states uh, from west coast to east coast. And the ones here are just the ones that have been reported. So it, it may be that they are found in more states than that. They're originally uh, from Asia. And in terms of their life cycle, so these eggs are uh, in these egg sacs that we'll see a little bit later. And out emerge these uh, nymphs or crawlers, uh, very similar to white flies. These crawlers will crawl around until they find somewhere to feed. They'll settle and they'll start uh, feeding. And then uh, here's an example of uh, what the female will look like. She will start uh, making this uh, waxy uh, or felty layer on the outside and uh, eventually get this gravid female. So inside there is where uh, all those eggs are. The female uh, lays all of her eggs in there, and she's in there as well, and, and dies in there, and the eggs, uh, new nymphs emerge. Uh, you also have some of these nymphs, though, that become uh, male pupa, uh, and out come these winged males. You know, winged males will, will fly off to find more females to mate with. So some of the, the actual really big concern about the crepe myrtle bark scale is not that it's on crepe myrtles only, uh, but that in the literature, some of the other potential hosts include pomegranate, axlewood, Chinese hackberry, persimmon, common fig, soybean, border privet, and a lot of rubus plants, and even uh, beautyberry. We've recently seen it uh, in the landscape go on to beautyberry plants. So if you start to see these scale insects on beautyberry, uh, there's a good chance that it, it may be the crepe myrtle bark scale as well. And so they, they do produce honeydew, as you can see here on the top surface of that crepe myrtle. If we go in very close, here are the crawlers running around. Here's what the adult scales look like uh, when, you, when you magnify compared to the young nymphs. So the young, the young are really hard to see with the naked eye. If you use a hand lens, you can see them. With the naked eye, you, know, you have to have a really trained eye to be able to see them. Uh, but under a magnifying, uh, under either a magnifying uh, hand lens or, or a microscope, uh, you can see them very well. And uh, there's always a question of, you know, so they produce these white, um, these white pupa, 
Uh, however, that doesn't necessarily mean, if you have a bunch of white dots or white spots in your tree, it doesn't necessarily mean you have an active infestation because those could be old exuvia. So in order to find out if you have that living scale on your tree or not, uh, especially with the bark scale, you can basically, you know, you, you scratch it with your, your, uh, your nail, your thumb, your keys, a coin, whatever hard surface you so wish. And uh, if it bleeds kind of purpley pink, uh, then that means you have an active or a, a living infestation there. If you just get a bunch of white fluff or emptiness that kind of comes out, uh, then that means that it's just old stuff that's just still sitting on the tree. So those, um, those, those exuvia, those pupil sacs and egg sacs can kind of sit there for, for a long time. And here you can see on the far left is what a really high infestation looks like. So uh, that branch is not supposed to look like it has powdered sugar on it. Uh, that is all a uh, crepe myrtle bark scale infestation there. And these females, so here's a, here's a gravid female if you dissect them. Um, on average, they have between 60 to 250 eggs. And this is looking at females of different ages. So that would include females that are quite a bit younger and haven't produced all their eggs. So that 60 may actually be on the lower, uh, lower end. And right now, if you go to eddmaps.org forward slash CMBS, you can see the current uh, reported distribution of crepe myrtle bark scale. And if it looks like there are no colored regions in your state or your state is not on this map, that means because no one has reported it yet. So I highly suggest that if you see it, go to eddmaps.org forward slash CMBS and you can go out with uh, some kids or maybe yourself, yourself, maybe you like to play uh, or your kids like to play Pokemon Go, consider playing Entomon Go. So it's basically like going out and capturing these invasives uh, and you take a nice photo of them. Okay, might not be quite as fun as Pokemon Go because you don't have little creatures that evolve uh, in here, but uh, they do out in the environment. Uh, and so you can go out there and, and, and report them and then there's uh, some of us that can kind of vet that infestation. So uh, that's, that's really helpful in order to see kind of where this uh, scale has moved off to. Now actually getting to the uh, monitoring, scouting, and or management piece. You know, so in, in a home garden, so I, I know there's a lot of you coming from all over. Some of you are master gardeners, uh, just homeowners. Some of you are with uh, governmental entities. Uh, so, uh, so trying to give a good monitoring strategy and control strategies for this wide audience across such a, you know, nationwide can be quite challenging. So these are just some very basic monitoring and control strategy tools. Um, nothing can really beat hand inspection. If you really want to know what is actually out there and you don't have a whole lot of plants, especially if you're a homeowner or master gardener, highly recommend uh, always just checking under the leaf. And uh, there you can see those signs of infestation before those populations really multiply and uh, become a lot more. You can also, instead of just looking for the insect itself, is looking for the signs of damage. So for all of these, they're going to cause some kind of sucking uh, damage. Now, this type of damage, so that's where you see this kind of discoloration. So I mentioned earlier that uh, these sucking insects are trying to get the nitrogen. That nitrogen is often coming from chlorophyll. So that's, uh, that, that chlorophyll is that uh, bit inside the plant that uh, gives it, that reflects that green color. And why you know those leaves look green and so when they are extracting that chlorophyll now all of a sudden it's not reflecting that green color anymore so you're seeing uh, these signs of sucking damage on that leaf and uh, there are other insects however that can cause this type of damage so don't assume that just because you see this that you have a, a white fly an aphid or a scale uh, there's also uh, thrips that cause rasping damage they'll scratch at the leaf and it'll kind of bleed and they'll kind of suck that up uh, and there are spider mites as well that will cause this type of damage as well. So there's, uh, there are other insects that will cause this type of damage. And it could also, there could, you could see some similar symptoms if you had some kind of abiotic factors like nutri uh, nutritional deficiencies or uh, plant diseases. Uh, you could see this kind of discoloration happening, although it might happen in a slightly different pattern. So uh, when you see it, it just gives you a sign to look into it a little bit more. And here, here's uh, another sign. You know, whenever I see this, <laughs> You know, I'll be we'll be traveling on vacation somewhere, and I'll I'll see a plant that looks like this, and I I can't resist. My wife, she's starting to get used to it, but I just can't resist looking under that leaf uh, and and finding some critters under there. Uh, there are also uh, yellow sticky cards. So here's an example of a little low tunnel with some strawberries inside, 
And uh, these yellow sticky cards, yellow, that color is considered attractive to a lot of these different insects. Uh, not all pests, but, uh, but a number of them. And so you can actually buy them with already some kind of sticky residue on them. So when they're attracted to it, they go to it and they get stuck. And uh, there are some limitations. This will only catch adults. So it's not going to catch uh, any nymphs that you already have in there. If you have a building aphid population, but no winged aphids yet, it's not going to catch them. Uh, so there are some limitations to this, but it does give you an idea of perhaps movement of adult insects. So it is useful for that tool. And here you can see uh, it catches all kinds of things. And on a weekly basis, you can check it to see what you have. And uh, if you're planning on removing it and replacing it, I always recommend sticking these in, say, a, a clear Ziploc bag or something like that because they can get really messy and dirty to play with. So by putting it in the bag, uh, you can still see uh, all the insects on the sticky card but not get your fingers all over it. And you can see here I'm wearing um, some gloves because uh, it didn't take long for me to learn, uh, going from Canada down to Texas, that there are these things called fire ants down here that will uh, try and kill you at every chance that they get. So I learned to uh, quickly to, to wear some gloves if I'm <laughs> kind of bearing around. Uh, hand lenses, very handy tools, uh, no pun intended. Um, they are very good, like I said earlier, you know, it's very hard to see those scale immatures um, without a microscope or a hand lens. Uh, typically 10 times magnification is considered sufficient for a lot of the field purposes you would use one for. Uh, additionally, you can get um, hand lenses with different fields of view. So you'll notice there that I have three different hand lenses. Um, the one on the top right is very small. And so it's going to be a little bit harder to use because it has a smaller field of view. The one on the top left is a little bit bigger, so it actually gives me some more viewing room. And the last one there on the bottom actually has three different lenses. And I can use those three lenses uh, basically in different combinations to get uh, multiplied mag magnification. So if I had a two and a three times lens and I put them together, I can get six times magnification. And that way I have a little bit more leeway or playroom in terms of uh, the magnification that I have. You'll see there that I have um, a 12 times and uh, let's see, I actually have it right here. Uh, there is a 12 times and let's say a, a three times. Uh, so that would give me 36 times magnification. Uh, and that's kind of useless because it's uh, really hard, really hard to see at that point. It's hard to get the insect in um, in focus, and you'll also see the higher magnification in this case has a very uh, small field of view compared to, uh, say, my uh, six times magnification. So basically, the higher the magnification, the kind of the less area and the, the lower the focal field that you can uh, really look at. So it's kind of harder to use. This one's kind of a more of a fun one than really practical. I do not recommend this for any kind of uh, practical use, but for educational use, it's kind of interesting. Uh, so, like I'd mentioned, you know, these insects obviously are shooting off uh, honeydew or kicking it off or exuding or whatnot. And you can actually buy this uh, paper, not to be confused with the yellow uh, yellow sticky cards. This is water sensitive paper that is yellow, and when in, uh, in contact with water. Uh, those spots start to turn blue. So uh, you can stick this under a tree that you know is heavily infested with aphids, and you can stick it on there for one hour, and then you can count the number of spots on there, the area that those uh, blue dots take up, and get an idea of uh, essentially the, the amount of activity, the amount of feeding that's happening on that tree. Uh, so this is great for something to do with kids. <laughs> you know, we were one time uh, trying to collect some of those glassy wing sharpshooters, and you could feel them. You could put your hands out, and you could feel those droplets hitting you, even though there was obviously no rain. And uh, a bunch of kids came around, and they were asking what we were doing. And uh, when I told them put their hands out, and I said, do you feel that? They said, yeah. I said, that's insect poop. They got super excited. So anything to do with uh, kids getting pooped on by insects, I think, is great for educational purposes. Okay, don't quote me on that. Don't use me on that. <laughs> All right. Uh, and... Uh, biological control. There are a lot, lot of natural predators. These insects are on the bottom of the food chain. So lacewing larvae, ladybugs or lady beetles, parasitic wasps, surface fly larvae, predatory mites, uh, aureus, which are also a type of sucking insect. There are some sucking insects that are considered beneficial. Uh, will all uh, assist in a natural environment to control or to manage your insect pests. So if you see uh, a few aphids, but you also see things eating them, and we'll kind of go through a little bit more uh, of those things that might eat them, 
uh, then you know you might want to question whether you should really spray anything because if you if you spray some kind of insecticide, especially if you're not really doing your research and know whether it'll impact your beneficial insect, uh, then you might end up hurting your beneficial insects. You'll you know hurt your aphids as well, but your aphids will be the first thing to come back. Uh, the predators won't be there without the aphids, so your aphids will reestablish and they'll do very well before you get predators again. So you always want to be cautious about that. Uh, especially in, a, in a, something like a home garden or a small vegetable garden. Now, obviously, uh, for a producer, uh, for someone whose livelihood depends on the crop being clean, uh, is a very different story. Here is an example for your enjoyment of a lady beetle uh, eating some aphids. And you can see right there on the cornicles of the aphid, these little droplets that come out, uh, those are th that, that alarm pheromone. Um, and so you can see all those other aphids panicking. And uh, I know this has given you all pure joy because of all the trouble that aphids have been causing you. But uh, lady beetles, they will eat, uh, you know, especially adults will eat at least 30 or 40 aphids a day. Uh, and you can see them all running away in panic here. This is the Asian multicolored lady beetle. This is the considered one of the most voracious lady beetles, meaning that they eat the most of, of some of the other lady beetles, but they are all also they are uh, they are also considered uh, kind of a nuisance pest in the house. So those are the ones that in the springtime, sorry, in the in the fall time, uh, will typically get into your house uh, and and become kind of that that nuisance there. Uh, and they can really build up in their populations in the field. So this is an example on crepe myrtle, the crepe myrtle bark scale. And you can actually count the number of larvae. There was one crawling down, two, three, one in the background there, four, another one, five, six, uh, seven there. And this here, this branch is actually uh, all lady beetle exuvia. So these are lady beetle larvae that have fed a whole bunch and now uh, they, they pupated and then after finish pupating they become adults and out feeding and these are all the, the shed castings after they've, they've done that metamorphosing and uh, so you can see here there are there are plenty so those lady beetle populations can build throughout the season so you really want to think about how can you work with these beneficial insects that are already helping manage a lot of your insect pests Here's an example of a parasitic wasp. This is a parasitoid of aphids. And uh, what this parasitic wasp does is basically like the movie Alien. I think they took it from us entomologists. So here it is, this parasitic wasp about to lay an egg inside an aphid. You can see the alarm pheromone coming out. Here's an egg inside the aphid, which develops into a larva. That larva feeds on the insides of the aphid until nothing's left but the carcass of the aphid. And that wasp will metamorphose under that aphid using the aphid carcass as a type of a shield. And then eventually when it's, it's uh, metamorphosed, it'll, it'll come out as a new wasp. And uh, some, of, some of these wasps, instead of having the carcass above them, will actually metamorphose inside the carcass. And so if you see, and these are called aphid mummies at this point. So when it's just that aphid carcass, that husk, and, and there's a metamorphosing wasp inside, they call it an aphid mummy. So if you start seeing uh, these mummies with your aphids, um, you know, so they're basically gonna be discolored and it looks like an empty shell essentially. Uh, then, then that's typically a sign that you have some parasitic wasps at work and they're gonna help us to start to manage uh, your insect populations. Again, I should uh, stress that this is for a kind of homeowner and or a landscape applications. Uh, if you're a grower um, that, that relies on your, your crop being pest free, um, just relying on natural infestation might not be enough. Either you might have to introduce more parasitic wasps or more beneficial insects, or you might actually have to apply some insecticides on a regular schedule. And here are some green lacewing larvae. So this larva here um, has essentially two little pincers. It grabs the insect, injects some digestive fluids inside the aphid, and then starts to suck it dry inside out. Uh, so there it is as well. I don't know if that's going to give you nightmares or if that's giving you a nice smile on your face. Uh, sorry if it's the nightmares. All right, in terms of insecticide control, always read the label. Uh, so this is very important. Uh, the label is the law. So there have been some misapplications of insecticides that have resulted in the death of 
uh, many, 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 many bees and beneficial insects. And so uh, if we, you know, just make sure we follow that label, which is the law, then we can uh, help ensure a little bit better uh, that we are applying these insecticides in a way that's safe for the environment and for the person actually applying it. Do not use a greater dosage than what's recommended on the label. You always want to rotate the mode of action. And um, by that is meant, uh, so if you type in, you know, every insecticide under the ingredients, the very first ingredient was what's typically known as the active ingredient. That's actually the ingredient that is causing the action on the insect. Everything else in there typically helps stabilize it, maybe helps deliver it, helps it spread, be spread throughout the solution, so on and so forth. But you can look up that uh, product. You, you, you type that up into this website, Iraq. So that's Insecticide Resistance Action Committee dash online dot org forward slash modes dash of dash action. And then there you can type in the insecticide and it'll tell you what uh, the number is associated with that insecticide. And that basically says how it how it kills the insect. And by rotating modes of action, you're helping reduce the, the chance of getting insecticide resistance. So if you're using the same mode of action over and over and over again, it might be it's di same, a different active ingredient, but if it's acting on the same mechanism, these insects will eventually uh, find a population that is resistant to that, and uh, now that insecticide is no longer effective. Uh, do not spray preventatively in terms of insecticides. There are some exceptions. So if you are, again, a, a grower, who this is your livelihood, uh, and you know that there are some instances of uh, plant viruses nearby and these insects could vector it, you certainly want to be on a preventative spray schedule in order to prevent uh, any viral transmission onto your crop. We want to do spot spray treatments, so just because you see some infestation in one part of your garden doesn't necessarily mean that everything needs to be sprayed. And I uh, always uh, recommend using .edu resources. So these are uh, resources that are typically coming out of extension personnel or applied entomologists at university institutions. And our, our job is to uh, do the, the research to find insecticides uh, that are actually effective and in different scenarios and, and to provide that uh, material and resources uh, to the public and to different industries. And so by uh, looking at those resources, you'll find some uh, more reliable information. Now, in terms of home garden, uh, you know, I didn't want to go into too many details of what to use and what not to use because it really depends on what you're growing, uh, the level of infestation, and again, if you're just a home gardener or a producer. But uh, for, for most general, just home garden purposes, using things like oils, uh, horticultural oils, uh, using insecticidal soaps, or using uh, an insect growth regulator. One example is azadiractin. That actually comes from neem seeds. Uh, so if you get neem oil and it doesn't have azadiractin listed, that means they've extracted the azadiractin. The neem oil itself acts as a horticultural oil. That, that basically smothers the insect. But that azadiractin is actually will, will disrupt um, the the uh, the hormones. It's actually considered an insect growth regulator. And uh, so it actually messes up some of the physiology of the insect when it's trying to go from one growth stage uh, to the next. There's a couple resources that I would recommend. Uh, one is the Southeastern U.S. To, uh, vegetable Crop Handbook. So now the 2017 one is available. Um, and this is uh, produced by the Southeastern Vegetable Extension Workers Group. So this is a group of extension personnel from uh, many different institutions. Uh, and it's a free PDF, 286 pages. And uh, if you're looking for vegetable recommendations of what to spray or what to use to control, uh, that one has many resources. If you're looking for uh, more landscape uh, or, or ornamental crops, you can look at the um, Southeastern U.S. Pest Control Guide uh, for Nursery Crops and Landscape Plantings. Uh, the link was very long to put. So if you just go to sixleggedaggy.com, six -legged it's currently the second post that I have there. The most recent post I put is actually a, a PDF of this presentation. So if you just want the PDF, uh, that's already posted on there. Uh, but you can also, the second post is, uh, is a link to this PDF here. That's a publication. Again, this is several different um, uh, academics from different institutions that have put this together uh, for recommendations on what to use in nursery crops and landscape plantings. And lastly, this one is for you go-getters, for you that want to learn uh, a little, get, get your hands a little bit dirtier in the actual uh, research and information. 
Uh, Arthropod Management Tests is a publication that was recently made open source, meaning that anyone can access it. Anyone who does a small trial, only a, really a small trial, so you know, I want to try five different insecticides, see if it kills aphids, I uh, collect my data and I can publish it in this journal. So anyone can now go in there and you might search, for example, aphid soap. You want to know if soap works on aphids. And it'll list the publications. So here there are uh, seven publications in this example. And you can actually look at them. This is one of the data tables taken out of uh, Palumbo and a publication 2013. And uh, these tables might be a little intimidating initially. But uh, essentially, if, what you see here is all the insecticides listed on the far left. So these are all the different insecticides, the trade names that they try it out. And the next column is what rate they use those. And after that, everything to the right of that is basically how many aphids they counted on those plants. So DAT, that means days after treatment. And they have a DAT1, which is days after the first treatment, and a DAT2, which is days after second treatment. So they applied the insecticide twice. And you can see the, uh, in, in the aphid number. So if we look just as an example to the untreated check, at three days DAT, they had 112 aphids. And if you go all the way to the far right, they had 504 aphids. So we always have an untreated check. So that is basically just aphids, and we don't spray anything to make sure that there isn't fu anything funny going on that would cause our aphids to just die a natural death. Uh, oh, sorry, that was the average. Sorry, in the last, the 28 DAT2, there's 1,552 aphids is what they counted. Now, if you look at this closer to SC, you see by three days after they sprayed, they only had 1.4 aphids. So that's compared to 112. So there's a huge difference there. And even if you go all the way to, let's say, 21 DAT2, uh, they only have 96 aphids compared to 459. So, you know, you have about a good, um, you know, month, month and a half, or about a month's worth of control with that. If you look at, say, Movento, there's another insecticide that even at the very end, uh, you have 44 aphids uh, instead of 1,552 in the untreated check. So that one worked uh, very well. You can look at Impede. Impede is the insecticidal soap. You'll see that it, compared to the others, didn't work quite as well. At three days uh, after treatment, it worked relatively well compared to the untreated check, but those numbers uh, sort of steadily uh, incline after that. So it, it has some uh, efficacy, but um, not quite as well as some of those others. Some other things to, to consider when you're reading, looking at those papers is, well, was that study done indoors in a caged environment so more aphids can't come in, or was it done outdoors or more aphids can come in? Uh, how many applications did they do, just one or two? What was the rate of insecticide used, the method of application, so a foliar spray, or was it a drench? Uh, the species being tested. So every species can act a bit differently. And something that just works well on, say, a soft scale won't necessarily work well on a hard scale or on a felt scale, especially because felt scales and uh, will we'll start to develop that waxy layer on the outside. So if it's a contact insecticide, once it starts developing that waxy layer, uh, it's not going to be able to penetrate and get them anymore. So uh, there are some differences there. And, and also even the plant host being tested. So on what plant host were their aphids on? Because that can also impact, uh, surprisingly, how well those insecticides work. And that is all I have uh, to conclude. If there are, uh, I guess, uh, any questions, I think I saw uh, all kinds of things popping up as I was speaking there. Thank you. That was awesome. And we do have a, a few questions. Let's see. One of them came in through the chat box and they are asking, how do things like neem, some of the organic oils, um, some of the in insect growth regulators, how do those affect other pests as well, other insects like pollinators and some of our other beneficials? Yeah, so I'm so glad you asked. So um, there have been some challenge. I'd say it's been quite challenging um, trying to tease apart. I think you'll find uh, there are a lot of PDFs or publications out there that will make assumptions about um, the impact of these insecticides on different insects. But in reality, um, there's a lot of things that need to be checked. I would, I would say just because something is uh, organic doesn't necessarily mean that it'll be better on beneficial insects. So for example, there are some synthetic insecticides that are highly specialized. So if you're reading the label and it says it will control aphids uh, and white flies, and that's it, it doesn't control anything else. 
there's a good chance it's not going to impact uh, insects in other groups. So things like bees and butterflies. So butterflies are in Lepidoptera. There are uh, caterpillar butterflies and moths are in the same group. Uh, bees are in a group called Hymenoptera. They are the social kind of insects oftentimes. And uh, so, you know, if you have something that's going to affect these sucking insects and nothing else, according to the label, and the label doesn't say anything about impacting bees, personally, I usually feel a little bit better about using something like that than an insect growth regular or a horticultural oil, which works as a, as a kind of a mechanical way of either smothering the insect or impacting them when they're trying to develop from one life stage to the next. Thank you. And there's another one from Danny. He is asking about soapy water to control these pests. Yeah. So, so the challenge is always, uh, so, so there are uh, commercially available insecticidal soaps. Um, so you can, so MPED was one of those that uh, we had just listed a bit earlier there. Um, and, it, and, and it can work, especially in a home garden. You know, if you apply it on a regular basis, uh, it can help suppress those insects. It might not work quite as well as some of the other insecticides, but the nice thing about uh, the oils or, or the soaps is that they have what's called very low residual. So if you're spraying it when the bees aren't on there, uh, you're not hitting the bees directly. Uh, it's not going to impact the bees. Uh, at the same time, that also means that if you spray that plant and then aphids come on the plant later, those aphids that came on the plant later are, are not going to be harmed by it. Um, some people also ask, well, how about mixing my own soap in my home? I can't speak to that because there are so many different types of soaps and I haven't really, I don't have the tests to, to, to say that, that would, that in general would work. Thank you. I see another one. Will aphids migrate from plant to plant, like say from kale to snap beans? Uh, so it really depends on the species. Uh, so like I mentioned, and there's about 3,000 or more species of aphids. Uh, a lot of them are kind of generalists, so they will go to different species, but there are some that are a lot more specific. So, uh, for example, there are some aphids that will only infest, uh, say, monocots or, or certain types of grasses, um, whereas some of them, you know, won't go on grasses at all. So it really, uh, it really varies, um, you know, and, and very rarely, but you can sometimes get what's called a host change or a host shift. So they can adapt to all of a sudden a new plant. Uh, but that usually only happens under very high pest pressure over a large area uh, and where resources are very limited. Let's see. Thank you. And here's one that actually came in a little bit earlier during your talk. Are there other ways or what are some ways to help differ dif differentiate between um, armored and hard scales? You know, um, I would say the, sorry, armored and hard scales. Um, so, I mean. Uh, but, yes, that was the question. I mean, so both of them are not going to, uh, to, to, to make any uh, honeydew. Other than that, I'm, I'm not too familiar specifically about what you're going to find in terms of differences and, and why it matter to look for the differences between the two um, in terms of actual um, treatment. Um, but yeah, that's, yeah. All right. And we have one. How would you control aphids if it were on a very, very large plant like a maple tree? The way that I would do it uh, on a very large tree is consider, uh, so assuming that it's um, actually become problematic. If it's just at a low level and uh, I see lots of natural predators there and maybe there's just a part of the season that the population gets really high and then it crashes, personally I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother doing anything. Uh, but if the population is very high, if there are complaints, maybe it's a client that I need to treat the tree for, maybe I park my car under it all the time and it's destroying the paint on my car because of the honeydew, I would treat it with a systemic insecticide. So I would consider using uh, something with the active ingredient imidacloprid, uh, dinutefuran, or thiamethoxam, because uh, all those are going to be taken up by the plant and give you several months of control. And that way you don't need some specially rigged up uh, sprayer to, to hit the whole tree. Uh, it's a lot easier to apply. Great. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions? While, while we're waiting, we've got a poll, folks. We're going to uh, launch a poll now. And this is just uh, 
giving us some feedback on uh, on the webinar itself and whether you found it informative or not. So please uh, please uh, log in there. While we're waiting on some other questions, I actually have one. I uh, in Western North Carolina and really in the state of North Carolina in general is a big effort for hops. You know, hops that are made for for beer and brewing. Aphids are a big problem with hop plants, and I hear lady beetles being or I hear lady beetles as a solution for controlling aphids, but, but on, on outdoor plants, is it reasonable to like get them? I mean, how do you get lady beetles in a particular location and get them to stay there? Is that, is that, um, is that possible? I guess is my question. So to my knowledge, uh, from what I've seen, uh, so what I've heard from people's observations and from what I've just kind of read is that um, lady beetles released in an, in an outdoor environment uh, typically are not that effective. Um, and you'll see a lot of places selling them, uh, but whether they actually work in an outdoor environment is that they typically will disperse. Uh, they might stay there and feed a couple days and then they'll kind of disappear. Now, you know, if you don't have any lady beetle populations to start with, maybe it'll help because uh, it'll, it'll inoculate. Maybe they'll lay some eggs in that area and maybe it'll help start up a population, but there's really no strong data uh, to my knowledge to support that. So in terms of production in an outdoor environment, um, the release of lady beetles, to my knowledge, is not considered an, an effective strategy. And that, no, that, that backs up the same thing I've heard from other folks. I guess if you have an indoor setting with a, a greenhouse or something like that, maybe, but not, yeah, not an outdoor setting. So. Oh, that's right, yeah. Okay. I also launched a second poll up, folks. For uh, We actually meant to launch this one at the beginning, but this is just some information on uh, – your your background and also where you're located at so we're, we'll take another 10 or 15 seconds and leave that poll up i should mention there are some um compatibility charts out there so this one um as an example uh that will you know say the different active ingredient of, of insecticides and how it might impact bees other biological controls or predatory mites in this example um, there are a number of biological control companies that will publish this type of data. So there's uh, Coppert, that's K-O-P-P-E-R-T. <laughs> Type this down as you're filling out the survey. Um, you know, there's also uh, BioLine, AgroSciences is another one as well, and BioBest. Uh, they all have kind of their bio uh, compatibility charts uh, where, you know, they have some research that, that uh, you can't really see for the most part kind of how they've, they've done it. And there's a lot of pro proprietary research, but they uh, show the results in a lot of charts. So you can see what insecticides are considered uh, okay on uh, some of their beneficial insects that they have. And these are things you'd also find uh, naturally occurring as well. Just so folks know, I'm sharing the, the results of the polls just so you can see that. I'll also share the results of the other poll too. We've got a, here one, another question that came in, and it's a, it's a good one. When aphids release their alarm pheromones after the, like after being attacked, does that chemical attract lady beetles? And if so, could synthetic alarm pheromones be sprayed to attract lady beetles? You know that is a good question. Um, I am not too certain. Um, you know, just thinking theoretically, I would imagine there'd be a bit of an arms race between aphids releasing, you know, if, if aphids release alarm pheromone that attracted lady beetles, those aphids would not survive. <laughs> they would get eaten up pretty quick. Um, and so the ones that probably released alarm pheromone that was attracted to lady beetles probably didn't survive. Um, now, however, you know, plants, and this is actually what got me so attracted to the field of entomology, uh, is, is the field of chemical ecology. That is how the chemicals in the environment uh, are used to communicate between insects or plants and insects. Uh, when, when insects uh, are feeding on a plant, oftentimes that plant will emit uh, some type of a chemical cue that attracts natural predators like lady beetles. Uh, and so the plants are actually oftentimes doing that part in attracting those natural predators. Uh, and, you know, I'm not, I can't say I'm too familiar of, um, I'm not too familiar with where, you know, anyone has kind of synthesized that um, to, to, to spray. I, I can't say I'm familiar with that in that, in that scenario. Well, family, thank you very much for um, thank you. talking with us today. It's a very present presentation, and I really enjoyed your videos. <laughs> thank <laughs> you so much. It's delightful getting eaten by the, um, <laughs> by the ladybug.
<laughs> Bugs. That warms my heart. Absolutely. <laughs> um, Excellent. So our, just want to remind you guys that our next webinar is going to be on August 4th. We're going to take the month of July off and we will be back on August 4th with uh, drain flies, house flies, and fungus gnats. And that'll be presented by Elizabeth Brown from uh, Texas A&M AgriLife. Uh, and we thank you for joining us today. Y'all have a good afternoon. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.